So I think it's actually fantastic uh, that uh, Andrew you know, kind of helped kickstart the, the topic uh, and the discussion today. Um, and I, I guess before we start, I wanted to just to get a survey of, I mean, I, obviously I think I see a lot of, um, you know, the youth leaders in the front and then also community leaders in the back. Um, I, I, I kind of wanted to ask you guys, raise your hand. Uh, if you guys are, um, you know, have, have uh, you know, sort of, I mean, I guess um, agree with what uh, Andrew said just now. That's awesome. That's everybody. Andrew, you. <laughs> All right, you better come out and vote then. <laughs> That's, uh, and uh, and the, also in the back, um, you know, can we, uh, the community leaders, how many of you guys also agree with what Andrew said? All right. Uh, hey, I think you guys were kind of. Uh, I think you probably didn't hear me, right? I said, "How many of you guys agree?" Do you, uh, you know, with what Andrew said? Raise your hand. That's all right. Now, now they're okay. Very good. So we have a very spirit group, uh, and uh, I, I think that's that's really good. Uh, and you know, it's 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 an you know, I, I, as I said, as a, I'm actually just a little bit by myself. I. Um, you know, I, I'm the founding uh, director of uh, Civic Leadership USA, actually. And the person who spoke there, uh, you know, was my mentor, uh, Sandy Chow. And actually, Sandy and I uh, started a number of things, including the Berkeley China Alumni Association. And kind of echoing what Andrew said, I actually, my first company, I, I failed, actually, miserably. And, and it, it will be no, no surprises that if any of you guys start, you know, your own first company, it will fail. But that's okay. You know, just like yeah, what just get that failure in young. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> well, absolutely. You know, I, I think I think it's okay to fail in in you know in Silicon Valley in the U.S. But just exactly like what Andrew said, you know, really want to get you know uh, sort of a mentor, someone that you can look up to and and whatnot. And, and this is really sort of the whole point about our conversation today. I think you know today conversation is on entrepreneurship and impact. Uh, and it's really meant because we heard, you know, many of you who are here, who are, you know, like youth leaders. And one day, uh, you're going to take the big flag. Uh, and that flag is going to lead us forward. Uh, and you guys will potentially, you know, uh, after Andrew, uh, as the president, you guys may be the next president, right? You know, after Andrew, after the election and stuff. Yeah, so yeah. you can come work in the White House. <laughs> <laughs> you could be, yeah, hey. Hey, did you guys all hear that? You guys all can work in the White House. Come on, give a hand yeah, of applause. I'm work in the Andrew Yang White House. We're going to call it the Gold House and then have some uh, dim sum parties there. I love that. I love that. Dim sum parties, right? Okay, very good. So uh, that being said, let's get started. Um, I think Andrew already did such an excellent job introducing himself, his background and whatnot. It's actually a really a reunion of the Cal family because I am also the head of the Berkeley China Alumni Association. And by the way, I we actually host the largest international conference at Berkeley. So just a few months ago, we hosted 1,000 people at Berkeley, and we have two, you know a few of my good friends who, including Nobel Prize winner Eric Bezek, 2014 Nobel Prize winner, uh, Turing winner, which is the Nobel Prize in Computer Science. But more importantly, my friend Betty E was a keynote speaker, a distinguished Berkeley alumnus. She is the state controller and a, a distinguished Berkeley alum. So, so actually, in fact, Andrew, here's what we're going to do. I think that uh, I haven't decided exact date yet on the next conference at Berkeley, October. So I want to actually, Zach, listen up. Zach, uh, I, I want you guys to uh, arrange Andrew because we're going to have a panel on ent entrepreneurship, by the way. So some of my friends, my good friends, including co-founder of Tesla, co-founder of Oculus, which is sold to Facebook for $2 billion. They're going to be attending. So I, I want to invite Andrew as one of the panel speakers. I think it's going to be the first week of October. And it's going to be 1,000 people or more, actually. We'll actually, with social media, we actually broadcast it to like uh, 200,000 people. So we'll, we'll, let's make something happen Thank like you, that. Thank you, That's tremendous. That'd be great. And you guys are all invited, by the way, OK? So whoever listens in, or the Andrew White House, you guys are all invited. Go ahead. Okay, at the University of California, Berkeley, right? You know, which I'm sure your parents and your, your friends all hang out at Berkeley. So we'll, we'll, invite, we'll be inviting you guys to come hang out with us. Okay, so let's, uh, let's get started. Um, I guess Andrew did a great job about telling himself, but I also want Sanjeev and David, which are both Berkeley graduates, uh, you know, to tell a little bit more about, you know, like, uh, you know, as you've seen all the young leaders and also community leaders. So my question is, tell us about yourself, especially when you were in high school and college days, how did you become who you are today? 
Uh, so, Sanjeev, where do you start? So, um, I did my college here in Texas, uh, came to school from India, went to Afghanistan for a while and then came here and really didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, my, I wanted to get become a doctor. My parents wanted me to be an engineer. I said, okay, fine, I'll be an engineer, going to school and didn't really want to study engineering. So, you know, some classes I passed, some classes I flunked. Anyway, I went, took about five years, graduated from uh, Texas Tech and Lubbock Christian University, and then decided uh, my final year, at, uh, the first year I didn't get, I got D's and F's, and the final year I had straight A's, and my uh, teachers said, you don't need to take your finals. So I packed <laughs> my stuff in the, in my car and drove out 28 hours straight to California. My brother was here, came home, and didn't know what to do. He was starting a company at that time, and uh, he said, hey, why don't you join me? And so I got, became an entrepreneur, essentially. But literally not knowing what I wanted to do in my life. And uh, I think, so I'm an accidental entrepreneur. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's, it's, as I went along, I thought I could be a teacher. I was studying math. And I said, you know, that's something I really love. I like math and I like uh, helping kids. Other students would come to me and learn. And it was great. But uh, in those days with math, you could not do very much. You could not get a job. You could not make any money. So started off with my brother at making $700 a month. And, uh, you know, we were starting off and went about building a pretty successful company, took it public in 94 on the NASDAQ. Wow. Um, and then uh, uh, I, my father, who was uh, working for the Indian government, resigned and came here and uh, went to school. At the age of 52, he went and did a PhD at Ohio State. Whoa. And uh, he came here and uh, moved to the valley as well, and he said, hey, I want to start something. And so he started a med device company, and I joined him, helping him raise money, put a business plan together. And it, that was, it gave me, in that process, we started working on a device for breast cancer, and it was, you know, came across people who had passed away with breast cancer, their, their wives or others, and uh, started to see that what we were doing was making a difference. In And I was at the same time helping with Seprogen, and uh, one of our uh, senior VPs came down with cancer, and uh, we were working with a company called Amgen down in Thousand Oaks, LA, and uh, they came up with a drug which was made on the product we were making, otherwise that drug would never have been made. And Ernie Gruen uh, talked to my brother and me one day while he was in the hospital, and he said, you know, had we not done this, I would not be alive. And it hit home that what we do actually makes a difference. We can make a difference in people's lives who we know. And I was, uh, I think, about 28 or so at that time. And that started me towards social entrepreneurship and what I needed to do. So it gave me a, gave me a purpose, so which I didn't have in school, in high school, in college. Suddenly I had a purpose for what I wanted to do in my life. <clears throat> well said, actually, Sanjeev, and, and thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, I think that we oftentimes, we, we know Silicon Valley as integrated circuits, but it's really, in simplest form, it's called Indians and Chinese, right? It's IC, you know, it's right. Indians and the Chinese. And, and Sanjeev is our Indian brother, you know, in Silicon Valley. Uh, so, interestingly, 
50% of my investors in my current company are Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> See, we, we already have this marriage of Indians and Chinese. Uh, so thank you, Sinji, for sharing that. Uh, David, please share your story. Yeah. Can, can you hear me? Cool. So I was actually born in Canada. So I was born in Ottawa, Canada, and I moved to Vancouver when I was about two. How I ended up moving was it, Ottawa's cold, really cold. I'm sure you're from New York, you know that. <coughs> And my parents had enough of it. They were like, we're going to go back to China. Screw the cold. So <laughs> <laughs> at that time, there was no direct flight from Ottawa to China. So they, tr they had a layover in Vancouver. They got to Vancouver. They got out of the airport. And their pl flight was delayed. And they were like, OK, let's just visit the city since we have a day. They got out. They went to the city center. And they're like, we love it here. We're just going to stay. So they never went back to China. And that's how I ended up in Vancouver. So <laughs> cool. that was my Vancouver story. That's how. That's why I was raised in Vancouver. And throughout my entire elementary, middle school, high school life, I was in Vancouver. I, n I never thought about leaving Vancouver until it was time to apply for colleges. And everyone asked me, what do you want to do? And I was like, I have no idea. People were like, be a doctor. And I was like, nah. They're like, be a lawyer. I'm like, maybe, not really. And then, <laughs> then I end up, I couldn't apply to anything because everything in Canada was, you have to be a specific path. You have to do this or that. So I was like, I just want to be in a city with good weather. So I came to San Francisco. That's how I came here. And I, I went to Berkeley and I studied business. So. Hey, you guys kind of listen up. What David said is he had to come all the way, all the way from Canada to be here. You That's guys fine. all are here blessed with great weather, OK? So give yourself a one applause, man. So, so that's how I came here. And during that time, so when I was in high school, when I was 15 years old, 14, 15, I started an organization called Social Diversity for Children Foundation. And it was because there was a bunch of things that were happening, but I really wanted to make my voice heard in the community and not just have the adults in the room speak on behalf of me. And I thought, why don't I just bring youth together? And if we have enough youth together, we can make an impact. We can make noise. We can actually do something. And that's how it ended up starting to what it, I built it today. So. Well, that's awesome. Um, you know, thank you for sharing that, David. Now, actually, before I move on, I want to acknowledge we actually do have someone special uh, here today who's just joined us, uh, our vice mayor from Cupertino. Uh, mayor Zhao, please stand up and to be acknowledged. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. Would you want to say a few words? Here. Just say a, you know, a few, few words because, uh, you know, Hi, uh, everyone. It's <laughs> I. I think I. I'm curious uh, about this forum, so I, I'd like to come. Uh, even though I will be seeing Andrew Young t uh, tomorrow <laughs> also, and I just last week. Um, it's I. I'm glad that after I became a mayor, I had so many chance to um, get in contact with a lot of uh, teenagers. I had uh, just given an interview for Monta Vista High School newspaper uh, this afternoon. And last week, we had a, a forum on kids about public health and another with kids about uh, different issues. So it's uh, we have amazing, amazing teenagers uh, in our Silicon Valley. They are sharp. They are insightful. So we have a lot to learn from all of you guys. What's the population of Asian Americans in Probably 60, 70 percent. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and then I, oh, I got. I win this town. Yeah. And I got elected uh, with a team that's mostly Indian and Chinese. And Indian was the, 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 the powerful portion <laughs> of our campaign team. <laughs> yeah. Shenji, if you can help out, right? Good. And she's going to win Cupertino for us, right? Uh, I'm a Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter whether you're Democrats or Republicans. We're going to help, you know, Asian Americans, right? Yeah, you know. I, I think he needs to get the Indian vote. Like, that's how you do it. You want to make I'm make any quite, comment, quite Andrew? Come off of that. Well, no. I the the comment I really want to make is just to, to reinforce David's experience for the young people here. Because when I raise your hand, um, so there. The, the skills required to be an entrepreneur, like the stuff we're talking about, like it seems I know, like very, very advanced and far out. Um, but what he did at 14 is something that any of you can do. And as a young person, you have like a, a real power around your youth. 
Um, so there are two types of things you can do. One is start a business, which has its own suite of things. And then there is help a nonprofit or uh, push a cause forward. And there, the second is actually much, much more there for you because if you reach out to people because you're young, they have to say yes and help you. <laughs> if they do not, then they are not nice people. So you can use your youth and say, hey, I care about this, like this organization. Just think about like right now as I'm talking to you, like what do you care about? And it could be, it's like I really care about this community. So you can help out with CLUSA or BRI. It's like I really care about uh, girls in developing countries. I really care about um, education. So like, and then you can do what David did and every nice person has to help you. And then when they start helping you, um, you will end up building the entrepreneurial skills because you're constantly like, you know, telling a story and selling your idea and like, it's not even your idea, it could be like, hey, this is why you should care. You end up building different types of relationships, better relationships. Um, when you send messages to people and say like, hey, will you help me? Some people that help you, you'll end up becoming much better friends with. Uh, and so this is one way you can start developing the muscles young in a way that's very, very immediate, and you can do a ton of good. Well said, Andrew. <clears throat> well said. Well, actually, we're doing really well because actually I, I prepared like three questions. They only answered two questions, and so up to you know now now the third question uh, for the you know for the three gentlemen. Uh, so one of the you know actually following that kind of about sort of what we said about positive impact, uh, the theme on, on entrepreneurship and impact. So obviously one of the greatest feelings being a leader or entrepreneur is really have positive impact, in, impact in our community uh, or society at large. Um, so I, I really like to, you guys to mention something that you're really proud of, like one achievement or, in, in, or more, you know, but, but certainly one achievement that you're particularly proud of as a leader. <laughs> I've been doing a lot of talking. I've been hot mic. So, uh, really, it's it's ultimately uh, coming up with something which will make a difference in people's lives. Uh, I've done multiple companies, but this particular company I'm extremely proud of uh, because what we are doing is. We've, we've come up, as Andrew had said earlier, we've come up with a point of care system. When you go to places like India and China and Africa and the and, uh, rest of the world, about 80% of the world's population has no health care. 70 to 80% of the world's population has no health care. And we don't realize that. We are living in a very blessed society. We've got everything at our disposal. When we talk to people out here, they said, oh, this is not required. But when you go to Africa, you find people dying. You go to China, you go to India, you go to these villages, tier three, tier four cities, people are dying. And so you've got to come up with, the way I look at it, my mission in life is to come up with something which can make a difference in their lives. Come up with healthcare, with weak, uh, diagnostic systems, treatments at low cost that these people can access. They've got to travel distances from their villages to the cities, and which means they have to be away from their family they, to get their treatment. They have to stop working and how they're going to take care of their family at that time, right? And so we need to bring healthcare to these people, not have them come to healthcare, come to the cities. And that's what we started doing. And th this technology which we are developing came out of Lawrence Livermore National Labs and Sandia National Labs and UC Irvine. We combined these technologies together. And there's a lot of work going on in universities uh, and people like you who are doing work like this, that uh, they're, they're kids that I know who are working on diagnostic uh, tests for cardiac and infectious diseases, and they're about 15, 16, you know, 14. And in high school, there's a kid that I know who's developed a test on uh, 
on paper, which is literally no cost. And that's that's a they're, they're taking it into these communities, into into Tanzania, into villages. They're taking it into Ghana. They're taking it into the villages of Rwanda and China and India, etc., to make a difference. And so I think each one, like Andrew said, we can get involved. Each one of us can get involved. Um, you know, I got my my son who was in high school a few years back. He didn't know what he wanted to do. He was taking part, and one day I caught him and I told him, get out of the house. And, you know, and then I decided this is not going to work, so we're going to do something about it. And so I needed help with creating a video for what we were trying to do. So I asked him if he could help me. And he got so excited, he started a video company. And he's helping, he's now in college, he's a second, uh, uh, third year college student. And he started working with entrepreneurs to help create videos to tell their story. So there's, there's all sorts of opportunities which all of you can uh, get involved with at this time. The world needs people like you. And, you know, there's, there's fresh ideas which you guys have, which we guys may be going along a certain path. You guys have got fantastic technology today which can make a difference. And you're, you're far more savvy with technology than people from our generation, and you can make a difference today. That's a really good point. I think that when Jeff, uh, Sanjeev said and Andrew uh, echo that point, uh, and it's, you know, really, if you don't know how to start, it's okay. Go to your parents. Go to your dad or your mom, because those are the people who want you to see, to see the most, imme most immediately. So it's okay, you know, and ask them uh, for some advice. And, and then, just like in Sanjeev's son's case, you know, start off entrepreneurship and, and all of that. So, so that's, that would be important. I, I, I just want to say, I think it's harder to be your age now than it was when I was your age. Um, and I, I think technology is very much a double-edged sword where I get the sense that for people your age, you're like constantly uh, accessible, constantly overstimulated. Like you're also much more academically stressed out um, than someone like, uh, like than I was because uh, just your school, like the schoolwork is much, much heavier you probably feel very, very heavily scheduled. Um, and uh, I know that that's a culture of this region too. And so then if someone's like, hey, like, you know, do something extra, be an entrepreneur, it's like, man, I, like, I, I can barely freaking like keep my, you know, like schoolwork straight and like and not lose my mind. Um, so all, all of that is cool in the sense that, like that, that's the sense I get from young people today is that, that we're like putting you in ridiculous uh, pressures and, and situations, and so I certainly don't want to add to that in terms of being like, hey, you can do more, you can do more. Um, the, the, I, I will say that there's going to come a point in your life, hopefully, that you find something that you want to do that's intrinsic, that is not because it's going to help you uh, get ahead. And that, I, I know it's true with Sanjeev, I know it's true with David, I know it's true for me, is that that's when uh, you're going to end up doing something entrepreneurial. Uh, and the main way to do something entrepreneurial is just to find something you care about that makes a difference to you that is intrinsic. That is not because it's gonna look good in your college app. It's not gonna make you look cooler for you know, the opposite sex or you know, same sex or whomever. Um, but it's just something that you wanna do and you just need to see happen uh, regardless. And I know Chuck did the same thing with uh, starting the alumni organization and whatnot. Like, you know, just wanted to make it happen. You wanna see it in the world. So I know right now this might seem a bridge too far, but like you will grow into it. David, you want to share? Yeah, so medical. So one part of our organization, we, we find villages or places in China, Laos, or Myanmar, or Thailand <coughs> that need medical help. That was a big part of our organization. We've, cured, we've treated about 1,000 people who were blind, and they wow. became, they, they can see now. Wow. No. <coughs> That's awesome. About 1,000. Restored sight. We restored sight for 1,000 people. Wow. And it was. Wow. We call it miracle workers, right? <laughs> When we first started, actually, we visited a village. We went to a house, and we wanted to see what the family needed. And we found out that the kid couldn't see. And we didn't know why, and the parents didn't know why. They didn't have the money to go to the hospital to get a diagnosis or any, any of that. So we, we were like, OK. So we brought a doctor from the city, 
It was a four hour trip on dirt roads in like four by fours. We were like going like crazy routes. I thought I was gonna die halfway through, but we got there. <coughs> and we found out that it was such a simple problem that like a thousand bucks would solve the problem. Wow. It was like literally a thousand bucks. So we brought the kid, next day we flew the kid out to the, the city into a hospital and we diagnosed him. They went under surgery the day after. And two days later, they opened their eyes. I, I got the pleasure to open up oh. the, um, the bandages and the kid just started crying. He was like, the world is beautiful. No. <laughs> wow. Yep, give him one applause. So, so that really touched me. That I thought I was doing things that like people were benefiting, but I didn't realize how much of an impact I was making. I was what seventeen at the time, I think. And wow. Seventeen, which is you guys here, right? Give him a long applause. Thanks. So, then, then the next thought was, how many people are similar? How many people can we cure with just a couple hundred dollars? And then we found out that if we Economies of scale, we add more people together, it would just be 150 US dollars and we no. can cure set of eyes. That's insane. I was like, no. So we came back, we fundraised, we did a lot of things. The next year we went back and we found 200 people who needed their eyes cured and we, we did that. And year after year, we've wow. been doing this ever since. So all it took was one case and you, kn you don't realize until it actually happens. And that's what, I guess that really touched me the most. Yes, Thank you. Really. Yeah, David, that's awesome. <coughs> I just want to follow up on something Sanjeev said because it's a conversation I had uh, literally this past week. So the conversation I had a while ago with my wife was this. Who, who's cooler, Chinese or Indian? <laughs> um, and so then we sat there and thought about it and we're like, well, I can think of like a bunch of name brand Indian CEOs. I can think of uh, the head of Google, the head of uh, Microsoft, the head of Pepsi. Like there are all these like like incredible Indian CEOs and I tried to do the same thing with Chinese and frankly it was a bit harder and so I had a conversation with this Chinese American CEO this week and he said that he is an engineering company just has like Chinese and Indian engineers working for him and then he said I had to sit there and like it was the Indian uh, engineer that I gave the big promotion to and the Chinese engineers were very mad and then and he said and the reason I did this and this was just him he was like is that the Chinese engineers did not listen, and the Indian engineer did. And if you're going to need the lead and uh, become a manager, you need to listen. And he said that he thinks like that actually is the key difference between why there are these Indian CEOs, these major companies, um, and fewer Chinese. So I just wanted to share that because I literally had that conversation this week, uh, and it was relevant to what Sanjeev had said. Uh, that's an interesting perspective. I actually happen to know the number two person at Microsoft, a good friend of mine at one point, and at one point meaning he was number two at Microsoft. In fact, the current CEO of Microsoft reported to him, but subsequently, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, Indian friend rise to the top as the CEO of Microsoft, and he actually, um, you know, didn't. And I think part of that is, it's also, a part of the reason why is to actually there's some interesting, I think the Indians in general, Indian Americans in general, I think they have strong technical backgrounds, but they also have MBAs. I mean, you look at, uh, you know, of course, the <laughs> CEO of uh, Microsoft, CEO of Google, CEO of Pepsi-Cola, all of them actually got MBAs. Now my friend happened to be, and you guys probably know him, Lu Qi, he's got PhDs, you know, like the Chinese are quote unquote very smart. Uh, and Qi is great, he's a great leader. Actually I sent him an email, he responded like uh, 2 a.m. in the morning to me, my emails and stuff. So very hardworking, both are very hardworking. But I think, I think sometimes it's, uh, you know, I think to, to the point that Andrew was make, making, it's as a leader, you know, I think that uh, you need to be more well wanted, and I think sometimes, you know, uh, uh, you know, it, you know, like in Chinese or uh, in certain cases, you know, I think we're very strong in certain area, but perhaps if we actually make ourselves, you know, if you sort of complete that cycle, right, strong technically, but also management, then I think the chance of you being that top position maybe one, one step higher. But anyways, uh, but Sanjeev, you want to say something? Because you're, you know, we're talking about you, your race, and you're laughing. Come on, Sanjeev, what do you want, what do you want to say? So <laughs> I, I, th I think it's not about, uh, you know, uh, it's not really about Indians or Chinese. At the end of the day, um, as I look at it, and I talk to my kids as well, we are immigrants, and all of us are immigrants here. Um, 
I think the first generation which comes in here of immigrants are have nothing. They have left everything behind, and they have nothing to fall back on. They have no bridge to cross back, and you have to make it happen, right? And that's what, whether it's Chinese, whether it's Indians, whether they are Latinos, doesn't matter who. The first generation takes that extra effort to make it happen, right? And I think, and I see that with my kids as well. They are a lot more lax comparatively, but they, each one of us finds a purpose in our own lives, and you will find that purpose in your own life. It's not going to happen because I said it, or your your dad or mom said it, or Chuck or Andrew or your uncle said it. It's going to happen one day, and that day is going to be the turning point in your life, and you're going to, you guys will rise way above anyone may have imagined, because you just need to find that purpose. For me, it was when uh, this friend of mine at Amgen, so I talked about one friend who had cancer and mm -hmm. he had the drug given to him. Now the guy who dr developed the drug was a Chinese-American, Philip Shea. He developed the drug and he was in, he ended up with leukemia and he ended up getting the same drug which he developed. And, you know, these two stories are the key for my turning point in my life. Had that not happened, I don't know what I would be doing. I, I may still be, I was looking at Wall Street and I was saying, hey, I want to be like these guys on Wall Street, right? Making tons of money. Then it was not about money after that. It was about making a difference. So it's, you know, it, it was my Chinese friend, uh, Phil, who developed this drug. It was Ernie Gruen, who was a white American. And they really made the difference in my life, ultimately, about how I changed. Right, meaning that everybody could affect, make positive impact yes. uh, together. Yes. And, and so, you know, and, and whether it's Chinese or, or Indian. But in any case, um, thank you. <clears throat> Uh, let's do this. I'm going to ask each of them one question, but I want to give plenty of time for you guys to do more interactive uh, with the speakers. So while I'm going to ask each of them one question, you guys start thinking, or if you want to, I mean, you know, want to write your questions to me, and that's okay too. But anyways, I want, want to let you guys think about that, questions you want to ask, okay? We have about 20 minutes, uh, you know, so let's start with, um, so Andrew, I mean, you know, I think obviously you've already gone through pretty much a lot of the question I want to ask you. One thing that I do want you to talk a little bit more about is, you know, you actually have a main policy on uh, universal basic income, or the freedom dividend, we tell, call it. Yes. Uh, could you tell us more about that, how that works, and what are other policies part of your platform? <clears throat> yeah, sure thing. So. Uh, Universal basic income, raise your hand if you've heard of universal basic income. Um, a lot of you have. So it's a policy that goes back to the founding of the United States. Thomas Paine was for it. Martin Luther King was for it. Uh, it passed the House of Representatives twice in 1971 under Richard Nixon. A thousand economists said this would be a great idea. And then Alaska actually implemented it uh, in 1982, where it's a, it's a policy where everyone in a society gets a certain amount of money uh, free and clear to do whatever you want. And so the freedom dividend I'm running on is $1,000 a month. So imagine those of you who aren't 18 yet. When you turn 18, you start getting $1,000 a month. Now, most of you are going to go to college, so your college is partially paid for. Um, but then it applies even after you graduate from college and make you more risk-taking, entrepreneurial, dynamic, creative, just having a bit of set money coming in. And our economy is now at $20 trillion. We're the richest, most advanced country in the history of the world. We can easily afford a thousand dollar dividend for people. It would also grow the consumer economy by about 8% and create two million new jobs. Now the reason why I'm so passionate about this freedom dividend is that if you go back to my truck driver example or the retail worker example or the manufacturing worker example, the problem is that what you're gonna hear from a lot of people is like, hey, why don't they just go back to school and get retrained and reskilled for new jobs? Like that, that's like the sort of intellectual solution. But then when you actually go uh, and spend time in these communities, you realize that if you were to line up 1,049-year-old truck drivers, most of them hated school 
uh, 28 years ago. And then if you say, hey, it's time to go back to school, then be like, what? And, and then if you actually had them go through school, and then they, you had a 50-year-old with a certificate, a company would much rather hire a 25-year-old at a community college who's less expensive and has less like bad habits than a 50-year-old former truck driver who like may or may not want the job and probably has health problems. So the, the reality is that the retraining, reskilling, the estimates are that it's going to address between 10 and 25% of the problem, and that between 75 and 90% of uh, these people are not going to actually be able to be retrained for a job, certainly that's anywhere in their part of the country. Um, and that's why what we're seeing right now in the United States, the reason why everyone seems so angry, is that American life expectancy has declined for the last three years, the first time since the great flu pandemic of 1918, because of a surge in suicides and drug overdoses uh, and people just going into despair. And if you go with me to Alabama or Ohio or Michigan or Western PA, you see these places falling apart. And so right now, the biggest thing we can do to help ease this transition for millions of Americans and make it so, frankly, they do not end up turning on us, turning on each other, turning on ourselves, uh, is to move in the direction of a dividend for every American adult that says, look, you're an owner and citizen of the greatest country in the history of the, history of the world, and we have enough to provide for everyone. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Um, David, actually, we, we talk about a lot about entrepreneurship, but really what you're doing is what you call, and actually, since you've mentioned that, social entrepreneurship. I, please tell us sort of the big difference between sort of the social entrepreneurship and sort of broader Silicon Valley entrepreneurship. <clears throat> sure. So the dictionary definition, entrepreneurship is you're creating a business to generate money, profit. That's all you care about. Social entrepreneurship, correct me if I'm wrong, is not only do you care about the profit, but you also care about the social aspect of what the business does for you. An example that I remember when I first got introduced to the idea was Tom's. Every time you buy a pair of Tom's, Tom's gives a pair to someone in need. There's, although there's like other uh, uh, unfortunate consequences to that, but in general, society is better off than if they didn't do that. So that's the difference between social entrepreneurship by dictionary. Personally, what I've been seeing is there's been more of a merge between social entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship. I remember when I was young, when I first got started, I read a quote somewhere. It was something about, <coughs> Muhammad Ali said actually, it was, the service to others is the price you pay for your room on this planet, on Earth. And I think companies are more getting close to that idea where it's part of their mission, not only to generate money, but also do some societal good. Example of that is like Apple. 100% of Apple's facilities are run on renewable energy. Or even a big up, a t car company, Tesla, in the Bay Area, their sole mission if they're to succeed, is to convert all of us to electric cars. So for them to succeed, it's also part of making society better. So that, that's what I, I, I view as. <coughs> great, great. Thank you for sharing that. Now, before I ask the last question to Sanjeev and, and then coming out to ask you guys questions, or you guys are, you know, the time for interaction. So please, uh, you know, think about that, the, the questions you guys want to ask. Sanjeev, uh, my question to you is, you know, I think you mentioned at the age of 28, you really have seen the impact of how medical science have changed lives. Now, the, the, the latest thing that you're doing, actually, in fact, you, you actually also spend quite a bit of time traveling to China as well, right? Please tell us the latest thing that you're doing. Why are you so passionate about this particular project, so, company? So this company, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's a point of care diagnostic system. Um, Literally, as I said, uh, healthcare is not available to the millions and millions and millions of people out there. Uh, when you go to the villages, there's no diagnostic centers uh, in tier three, tier four cities. There, people are, as I said, are dying uh, without a chance for cure. Uh, breast cancer, which is our first product we're working on, there's about 1.6 billion women over the age of 40, and uh, going down to the age of 30, there's over 2 billion women, and only 60 million are screened, and it is known that if you can screen these women early, 
you can find breast cancer early and you can save their lives at a very very low cost very low cost and so about 60 million women are screened every year less than 4% if you were to screen and and out of those 60 million 2 and a half million women are found to have breast cancer half a million women die every year of breast cancer these are the statistics, statistics by who not by us now if you were to screen all 2 billion women you can imagine extrapolate how many women are probably walking around with breast cancer and how many are dying every year and there's no reason that they should it just needs to be found early this technology at lawrence livermore was developed for the lab it was a phd project this girl was doing and she went in got a, she she won a business plan competition uh, in sacramento but it never went anywhere um and this was something which a quest diagnostic could pick up i came along and i saw the technology and i said okay this is great but unless i bring it we can bring it to the community to everyone it's not going to help and so saw something with sandia was doing uco one was doing and we said well if we marry these together you'll have something which can make a difference and we can take it into these villages we went into china we went into africa we went into india into the villages and what you find in these cities in places like mumbai or beijing or shanghai or uh, some of the major cities you've got people who come from these villages and they're sitting there for waiting 5 days camping out to get their turn and if they miss that turn they will not get another chance to see the doctor for another couple of months at least and so what we are talking about is we will take it over to these villages that they don't need to come in they don't need to get diagnosed in the hospitals through cloud connectivity the doctor can see it somewhere else the test can be done locally and these people don't have to leave their homes our goal was to make the cost so low less than $2 a patient for breast cancer screening which today with mammography is over $200 and if you can do that with breast cancer you can do it with any other disease we can do it with cardiac we can do it with tb we can do it with dengue doesn't matter what and now you can start changing people's lives helping them right the thing which we care about most is the health for our family can we can we give them food can we give them shelter these are the three basic necessities and so that's why this is i'm passionate about this that with this we can make a difference in people's life we can bring healthcare to everyone okay thank you very much <clears throat> all right so now to open up for q and a um Anybody has any questions? Right there. Perfect. I see some hands over there, but please ask us. Hi, I'm Albert. I'm a junior at um Aragon High. And uh, I want to ask Andrew, uh what was it like being ambassador for entrepreneurship for the White House? Like what did you do? Um like what were the impacts that you saw out of the job? Yeah, so it was an honorary post. Um uh the the main responsibility was to help represent america at the global entrepreneurship summit which was actually at stanford which is like actually pretty easy uh the one before was at kenya and so i sort of got a little lucky i suppose uh and then i i moderated a panel with the secretary of commerce penny pritzker and a bunch of international trade ministers uh and then made some recordings and talked up entrepreneurship and then i also made a pledge to do to help create like uh hundreds of entrepreneurs which I was doing anyway frankly so it was like not much of a pledge um and and the truth is that most of these government positions are honorary uh like uh one of the the drawbacks i think to government right now is that it traffics in appearance and press release uh and half the time they don't actually follow up to see what you did um that that's true also with like Clinton Global Initiative and a bunch of other things where unfortunately like a lot of stuff is around like the the 
the fun pictures in the beginning, but then no one follows up later, truthfully. Well, actually, that's great. I was actually at Stanford with John Hennessy at that time, with, and actually what, sitting right next to President Obama's, um, you know, like motorcade, which was pretty cool, pretty long, but pretty heavy. But that's interesting. I was. That's thanks for sharing that. But you have a question, please. Um, this is also for Andrew, and I'm Rachel. I'm a junior from Missions, and I say hi. I was just wondering, how is it like growing up in a like, not uh, growing up in an area where there weren't, weren't that many Asians, like, and compared to here. Yeah, and it's one reason why I, I look at you all um, and I just think like, wow, so lucky. <laughs> um, so it, it, I, I was like one of the only uh, Asian kids in my grade and I, I'd skipped a grade so I was very small. Uh, and so I felt this need to try and prove my um, belongingness and masculinity at every turn, <laughs> um, which you know didn't work out that well a lot of the time. Um, and I also had this urge to like stick up for myself anytime someone um, called me, uh, you know, a gook or something like that, which happened quite often. Um, and so, I don't, I mean, I guess people aren't allowed to say that stuff to you guys now, but like, I mean, I got it like all the time and then I would just be like, okay, I guess it's fight time. And then, um, and then because I was smaller, I would lose most of these fights. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, I guess that's a fairly reasonable description of most of my, <laughs> most of my formative years. Um, but then, uh, you know, I, I think um, I ended up, uh, developing like a real sense of I identity um, through that, I believe. A bit of a chip on my shoulder too. Um, and I, I also have, I think I have like a, a better empathy for people who find themselves singled out or marginalized. And so I'm very grateful to it on that level. Can we have, uh, yes, someone in the back? Okay, sounds good. Okay, go ahead. You stand up. Right. Earlier you were talking about how you want to turn the clock forward to help solve this problem of technology causing unemployment in those swing states. What steps do we as a society need to take in order to cause this to happen and how exactly is this going to help that problem? Sure, so I, I referred to the freedom dividend which is what I've rebranded universal basic income because it tests better with middle Americans with the word freedom in it. Uh, but the, the big thing is that you have to broaden the uh, notion of work to be beyond our current capital efficiency. And the example I use is my wife is at home with our two boys, um, one of whom is autistic. And right now her spending time with them um, counts as zero in GDP and zero in the market economy. Um, but I would propose that what she's doing is actually immensely valuable and we probably need m many more people doing work like that. So happily, something like a universal basic income ends up rewarding and monetizing much of the unrecognized and uncompensated uh, work in our society. And then hopefully we can create more uh, opportunities in that direction so that if you are part of a town that has lost its factory or whatnot, that if you are doing work that helps make other people stronger, you get rewarded for that. Um, and that your value becomes intrinsic and based upon you know, your stat, your value as a human being rather than saying like a software engineer is worth 200,000 and a former truck driver is worth zero. Um, because over time, the market is going to turn on more and more of us. Uh, and Sanjeev can tell you that software is going to displace radiologists just like it's going to displace truck drivers. Uh, and the radiologist is like highly educated, spent many years in schooling, like, uh, but they can't compete with a, a program that can reference millions of films, that can see shades of gray that are invisible to the human eye. So we need to start evolving to regard ourselves as having a value that is independent of what the market is saying. That's how we get there. Very good, good questions. Here. <clears throat> Um, hello, my name is Jing Huang. I work with the Department of Justice of California. I'm not an entrepreneur, but uh, thank you for sharing. I have a question for Andrew. I'm just uh, curious, and how did you come up with the idea to run the presidential election? And uh, was there like a, uh, like a conversation, or is there some person uh, inspired you to uh, decide to become the first person to try the crab meat? Thank you. Well, yeah, you're quoting me. It's like that quote is like, there has to be a first person to eat the crab. Um, so uh, I think the set of experiences that led me in this direction were like, uh, I was with President Obama a number of times. Um, I met uh, President Clinton and President Bush, um, many senators, many governors. Um, and I, I realized that uh, they are no different than us. You know, they're, they're just people. Um, and that 
if we want something to happen, then there's no reason to think like, oh, that it's going to happen without us um, stepping forward. And uh, being relatively circumspect, I, so I, I realize that for whatever reason, our political system is not able to reckon with the economic uh, transformation, the realities, but I went and tested it out where I went and asked politicians and I said, what are we going to do about the fact that technology is affecting our economy in this way? And I realized that no politician wanted to touch it. And so that's when I said, okay, if this is going to happen, it's going to have to be me. And, and this is something an entrepreneur, you, you see this, is that here's the opposite of entrepreneurial thinking. Someone's going to take care of that. Entrepreneurial thinking is that it is not going to happen unless I do it. Uh, and unfortunately, in this instance, that was the case. And so that's how, how I decided to run for president. Very good. Two more questions. I think a lot of interest. I'm sorry. Uh, one question and then last question over there. But please, Mayor Zhao. Hi. So we are Chinese and Indians. And we are a very minority of in, in the United States. Now you are running for president. How do you become mainstream? I think we are being ignored in the media. Whenever we get on the media, it's negative news. And they have this stereotype about Chinese, but then not all of us are engineers. Not all of us are, are good at math. <laughs> Many of us are just, just like everyone else. We could have good at different things. So how do we break out the mold of Chinese so that we can become real American. <laughs> you know, I, I could not agree more that we are fighting an uphill climb in the media. Um, I've experienced it now over the last number of weeks and months. Um, but one thing I'd like you to do is if you Google Andrew Yang, Iowa, you will see a video of my speaking to a thousand Iowans and I am the only non-white person in that room. Um, Iowa is 94% white, New Hampshire is 92% white. There is no way that I'm going to have a fighting chance for the White House unless I get uh, mainstream Americans behind me. But I'm happy to say that the vast majority of my supporters to date uh, and my team um, are not Asian. Um, and that if, I, if you look at what I'm talking about, like they sense that if I'm in Iowa and I'm saying, hey, have you noticed your store is closing? And they say, yes, I have. And they say, why is that? And then they say, Amazon. And I say, yeah, that's right. What are you going to do about it? And they're like, I can do something about it? And then I was like, yeah, if you make me president, I'll bring back some of that money and you can rebuild your Main Street economy and give your kids a reason to stay. And so they listen to that. And that's a message that is not has nothing to do with my being Asian, except for the fact that my being Asian actually gives me enhanced credibility when I'm talking about technology and numbers. Where when I say, when they say, hey, I want to give you $1,000 a month, and they were like, do the numbers work out? And I'm like, yeah, the numbers work out. <laughs> and then they're like, all right. So, uh, you know, so we have to lean into the things that do like set us apart. But I could not agree with you more that we are pushed to the side in the media in a really, really dramatic way. I didn't realize it myself until I was running for president. And I realized it in part because a significant proportion of, and, and at this point, if you look, I've been covered in the New York Times, uh, CNN, MSNBC, like most all of the major publications are now covering me. I'm included as a top tier candidate. But a significant number of the early press hits that the campaign got were from Asian American journalists. Like Asian American journalists were like, hey, we should talk to the Asian uh, presidential candidate. Uh, and, uh, and that pattern was consistent enough where I realized how central identity is to American life, where it was easier to ignore me uh, if you were not Asian American. All right, Dennis, you're gonna ask the last question, go ahead. Uh, hello, my name is Dennis Wang. Um, I would like to ask uh, Andrew Yang, uh, how, how would the freedom dividend uh, affect the economy? And since you're a nice person and I'm a youth, please explain it like, you would to like a fifth grader because I know nothing about the economy. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. <laughs> All right. Um, sure. So, so right now, for context, the economy is twenty trillion dollars. Uh, federal budget's four trillion, and the freedom dividend would be approximately one point eight trillion in addition to existing federal spending. Give you a sense: one point eight trillion through the entire economy. Now, the the way you think about how it would affect a particular town. And in, in a way, this is a terrible town to use as an example, so I'm going to use another town. 
So let's say you had a town of 50,000 American adults, and that President Yang, 2021, uh, uh, because of people like you and other Americans around the country, say, like, I'm president. I'm like, hey, guys, let's pass the Freedom Dividend. Now, if the people in that town were to get $1,000 a month, I'm going to ask you this question as, like, you're not actually a fifth grader. What are you? All right, as a 10th grader. So I'm going to ask you, like, if you were to give a family in this town, let's say in Missouri, $1,000, what happens to that money? That's exactly right. They're going to spend it on food, car repairs, the occasional night out, health care, like, uh, you know, some sort of home improvement. Uh, maybe they'll save a tiny bit. And that's going to happen at every household. But a lot of that money is going to get spent right in that town. Some of it's going to go up to like the Amazons and the Netflixes of the world, but not a high percentage because most of the money is going to go to the consumer staples. So then the, the businesses in that town, the restaurants, the tutoring services, the garage, the hardware store, all sell more. They sell about 10% more. And then they end up hiring more people in that community. And then if someone in that town wanted to start a business, let's call it a bakery, then it would have a greater chance of succeeding because people have higher disposable income to be able to buy muffins or cakes or whatever it is. And the person who's starting the bakery knows that even if their bakery does not work out, they'll still be getting $1,000 a month so they'll be able to support themselves. So what it does is it grows the consumer economy, it improves the business environment, it improves the circulation of money, uh, it creates jobs in those environments, and it also ends up being a catalyst for culture, arts, creativity, and entrepreneurship. How did I do? Right? Yes. <laughs> All right, very good. Actually, in closing, actually, I want uh, maybe a couple of people to say comments about what they've learned. And we have a representative here. Uh, she's going to say a few words what she's learned from her perspective. And I'm going to probably pick one of you guys to say, uh, maybe a guy, please. Uh, introduce yourself and then what we'll kind of. Uh, hello, my name is Maxine and I'm uh, a freshman from American High School. And I think for me, the key takeaway is um, the mindset about what it takes to be an entrepreneur. Because I always saw entrepreneurship as being very daunting, but today I kind of saw it as just the mindset that you have to know that you have to step up and have the courage and just think that I need to make this happen and it won't happen unless I actually do it. I think that was the key takeaway for me. Well said, well said. Give her a round of applause, please. Okay, we're gonna, thank you so much for sharing. That is great. So we're gonna have a, a, a guy to, Share a little bit of that. Thank you. Uh, introduce yourself, Henry. Um, okay, my name is Henry Xu, and I'm a sophomore from Washington High School. And I think what I learned today here is that, um, like, I've always had this problem where I didn't know what I was going to be. And I think a lot of people in this room, like, also have this problem. Like, they don't know what they're going to be, and they see everyone else, like, all the adults around them, all the people around them, like, their peers they are already doing stuff, they're already doing more th than them. And, you know, it builds a kind of insecurity. And I think, like, I found my solution today when um, David, like, said that there's always this moment, like, when he found the moment when he knew what he was gonna do. Like, I also thought that, yeah, I'm going to find the moment where I know I'm going to do, yeah. Thank you very much, well said. And in closing, actually, I want, uh, you know, I think I, as entrepreneurs, uh, which all of us are, and you guys too, because you guys are young entrepreneurs, I think one thing that I want them to say is action items, meaning that going forward, you know, and I want them to comment on, you know, after leaving this room today, what's your recommendation about one thing that you'd like them to take action, you know, leaving this room? So I'll let Andrew say the last, because he's gonna be our next president. That's, <laughs> that's the goal. That's the goal we're all supporting, right? Yeah. Thank you. I can't hear you, right? Yeah. All right, there you go. Okay, send Chief, David, and then Andrew will do the closing. I think what I'd, what I'd like to ask each one of you to do is go back and think what you're doing 
you know, look around and see what you're doing and what can make a difference in this world and what you're excited about. Don't worry about necessarily what the world is going to say. What is it that will excite you and can make a difference? And when you, and if you can, if you can answer that question, I think you'll find your purpose right there, and you'll be able to do, you'll do a phenomenal job from that time on. Great, great, thank you, <clears throat> David. I would say, go home, and then every morning you wake up, make your bed. No. <laughs> Why? Hold on. Because no matter what happens that day, as long as you made your bed, you accomplished one thing in that day. And you did already did something. And you can go out of the house knowing you already did something. And once you start thinking that mindset, mindset, you'll start accomplishing more and more and more and always challenging yourself further. So yeah. Great. Thank you. Andrew, please. All right. So the first thing you do is go to your browser and set the home page to yang2020.com. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I'm, right. I'm just kidding. All right, uh, so the, the, the action orientation I, I would want you to do is uh, try and find something that requires you to ask at least five people to do something for you. So the easiest thing to do would be like, hey, here's this organization or cause, and I want you to like, you know, sign up, add your email address, donate $10, like something along those lines, um, and then just push people to do it. Um, and then you'll find that that might be uncomfortable at first because you have this feeling, it's like, oh, I don't want to annoy anyone. I don't want to ask anyone to do anything for me. But the thing you find out as entrepreneurs is that relationships actually get stronger when you ask people to do something for you. The misconception, the big misconception around entrepreneurship is that I can make things happen because I know lots of people. The truth is actually the reverse. It's uh, I know lots of people because I make things happen. Like uh, when I started Venture for America, I did not know like 90% of the people that ended up supporting Venture for America. You know, I raised $20 million for Venture for America over my time as the founder and CEO. So people are like, oh, you just must have known people with lots of money, like uh, they had started. I did not know the vast majority of those people. But then you go to them and say, hey, this is what I, I this is what I'd like to accomplish. This is my vision. Like here's how I'd like you to help, um, and then people step up. So just find something that requires you to ask five people to do something for you. It can be big or small, and then see how that feels. And then what, what's going to happen is you're going to find it uncomfortable, but it's going to get more and more comfortable by the fifth person. And then and then if you're ever in that situation again, then when someone's like, hey, I need someone to do something, um, then you'll do something for them, and then your relationships end up getting built up over time. Well said, and, and that's, um, you know, uh, 